Thank you so much, uh, Bree and Chanel, and good evening, everyone. I cannot wait to hear the work you'll all be sharing tonight. I want to thank Girls Right Now for inviting me to participate in the chapter's reading series. And I also want to thank my family, particularly my sister Anna, who's here, uh, and brought her children, my 12-year-old nephew Max, and Giselle, my niece, who's nine years old and a budding writer herself. So no pressure, ladies, uh, but just know that as you read your poems and essays and stories tonight, the, uh, the future generation of young girl writers is, is listening and taking notes. It is uh, such a joy and honor to, for me to be here and to see Girls Right Now thriving as a hub for creative young women and their accomplished mentors. I understand that the organization will be coming up on its 20th birthday in a few years, and I feel both very proud and kind of old to have been a mentor at Girls Right Now uh, around 2006, which feels like a million lifetimes ago. But I remember applying for the job, and I think it involved uh, sending in a resume or a list of accomplishments and maybe writing a letter about how pre prepared and qualified I was to inspire a fledgling young woman writer in New York City. But as you can probably guess, my dirty secret as I sent in this application is that I was the one in need of inspiration. I was in graduate school at Columbia, getting my MFA in fiction writing, but very slowly. Uh, though I had finished my coursework, I had not yet turned in my thesis, which made me a ghostly kind of super senior presence floating around the edges of the campus. I was nursing a broken heart after a three-year relationship that I thought would have a much happier ending. Many of my friends from graduate school had scattered all over the country after graduating. And uh, worst of all, the writing was not going well. The stories I had been working on for a few years already uh, didn't seem like they were any good, and the longtime dream of seeing my name in print or my book in stores suddenly felt shallow and empty in light of the isolation and lack of purpose I was feeling. But when I became a Girls Right Now mentor, something clicked. It wasn't just that the monthly group workshops were so much fun and the cheese snacks so delicious, though they were, and it wasn't just the field trips to spoken word slams and other events that reminded me just how many brave and talented writers our incredible city holds. But my mentee and I used to meet for writing dates at coffee shops. Uh, we became experts at trying to find places exactly halfway in between Coney Island, where she lived, and Harlem, where I lived. Um, and we just kept discovering so much that we had in common. In between her many school projects and assignments, she was writing about her experience as the American daughter of a Korean mother and a Mexican father. And as she and I read books about race and identity together and discussed how our upbringings and immigrant families overlapped and diverged, my own project, a short story collection about Filipinos uh, leaving the Philippines, uh, where I'm from, and working all over the globe, stopped feeling like a deadline I was failing to meet or an assignment that I couldn't finish, but part of a larger uh, ongoing conversation that didn't begin and end with me. There's a word for people coming together around a common purpose and shared identity, and that word, of course, is community. And more than most organizations, Girls Right Now understands the special role that community plays in the life of a writer. In graduate school, I learned all about the hard work and often lonely discipline of writing, work that requires you to close your door, turn off your phone, sometimes cancel plans with friends or tell mom you'll call her later, and be alone with your thoughts. But at Girls Right Now, I was reminded 
that one of the most special rewards of that work is the opposite of solitude, it's connection. Many of you will have this experience through your writing tonight. A friend or stranger in the audience might approach you and tell you that a line that you read struck or moved them in a way you didn't expect. And many of you I know will experience it down the road when an editor who really gets your work takes it upon him or herself to publish it. And when a reader takes the time to review your published work and you realize that your characters and stories suddenly have a life outside of your own head. Girls Right Now reminds us that writing is not just about what we want to say, but about who will be there to listen and respond to our words. And this community also taught me that sometimes when we're stuck and, str and struggling with a blank page, often the best medicine is to get up from our desks and go out and listen to other people. So ladies, I hope that your family of fellow writers and kindred spirits just keeps growing with each year that you write, and that in addition to publication and prizes, your hard work as writers is rewarded most of all with community and connection. And of course, another word for human connection and community is love. So I'd like to end by reading a short passage from my book about love. Um, this is a story, this is from a story called A Contract Overseas, which is told by a young woman in college in the Philippines. In this part of the story, she's just discovered fiction for the first time and started writing stories inspired by the life of her brother, Andoy, who works as a chauffeur in Saudi Arabia. And she's so excited about writing fiction that she's thinking of changing her major, but also feels a little bit guilty about it because she doesn't come from a wealthy family, and in fact, she's only able to afford college because of the money her brother sends home. So it's not the most practical thing she knows. And uh, this part of the story is where she uh, discovers writing for the first time. Before I knew what I was doing, I had found a bench beside the student union and started writing in my notebook. In Riyadh, he shared a flat with nine men, I wrote, gardeners, servants, or drivers like him, or construction workers on the pipeline being built from Saudi's oil wells to refineries offshore. I could pass for a motto now, he wrote on an aerogram as thin as onion skin about the way the desert sun had darkened him. I skipped my afternoon classes, gliding through campus, landing on a grassy quad here and a flight of stone steps there to add a paragraph or sentence. At home, my mother begged me to consider the electric bill as I wrote by the kitchenette bulb through the night. I barely ate or slept for two days. If someone had predicted a year earlier that my brother would inspire me one day to write fiction for fun, I wouldn't have believed them. Now it felt both new and faded to me, a thing I didn't know I'd always meant to do. The words came easily at first. It made me happier than I'd ever been to sketch out scenes in my notebook and type them up. Aren't you in a good mood, said my sister-in-law, Ligaya. And then, did a man finally notice you by some miracle? And then I read my draft again, stacking the masterwork in my head up against the mess I'd made on the page and sank into despair. Whoever he is, he's not worth it, said my mother, as I moaned and wallowed face down on the sofa. That night, the same pages I had filled in manic fever were torn into shreds, floating in the creek outside our house. The summer passed like this. From the clouds of inspiration to the gutters of dejection and self-loathing and back again, over and over. My grades, meanwhile, slipped in only one direction. By the time I failed a term paper in psychology, after ditching class to write the day, to write the day it was assigned, I decided that my problem was I hadn't read enough. And the hole in my apprenticeship was too wide to close in my free time. I resolved like a determined suitor to get serious. In the middle of my sixth semester in college, 
I dropped my journalism major and took up English literature with a special focus on creative writing. Shifty? asked my mother. Shifty, I said. That was the registrar's term for students who switched majors. It happens all the time. The average student changes twice or more before graduation. I admitted that the switch would set me back a few semesters. How much longer, said my mother. How much more money is the question, said Ligaya. I couldn't blame them. What would I want next? A room on campus? A semester abroad? Rather than try to sell Andoy on my craziness, I released him. I'm going part-time again, I wrote to Jeda. I'll pay my own way, take another decade to finish if I have to. He called as soon as he received my letter. It says here it just hit you, he said. One day you knew. It's true. I knew how cracked this made me sound. Now it keeps you up at night. You feel awake for the first time, like you've been sleeping through life before. Instead of answering, I pictured him in the servant quarters in Saudi, standing by the phone, untangling the cord. Everything appeared to be a shade of desert sand, the walls, the carpet, and the telephone, a yellow pencil dented by different teeth, a yellow notepad filled with scribbled messages. Squares of yellow light checkered the hall from the doorways of the shared bedrooms off it. There'd be a smell of instant noodles and dirty laundry, as in boys' dormitories I had visited. And from opposite ends of the hallway, the sounds of a communal TV and a running toilet. Congratulations, he said. Congratulations? Now you know what it's like. To change my major? To fall in love. Andoy laughed. I always wondered who it would be for you. What boy could keep up with the toughest girl I know? I should have guessed. It wouldn't be someone for you, at least not a living someone. It would be Shakespeare and José Rizal and the Catipunero outside the student union. I cringed. It sounds ridiculous, I said. Forget it. No, said Andoy. Listen, I'm no scholar, but love I know about. That's my major. I'll never get a decent job. His optimism had me arguing against myself. Relax. Love's a miracle, not a disaster. Who said it would be easy or convenient? But if you can't sacrifice everything for love, what else is there? It'll take more time, I said. And money. Yeah, love does. He laughed again. You'll learn that quick. He did have one condition. I want to meet this new love of yours, said Andoy. Anything I wrote, he said, I was to send him a copy. Thank you.